We're back today with another AMD Ryzen as AF CPU, and that's going to be the R3 1200 AF. The AF naming got popularity with the 1600 AF, and specifically that came about because the SKU for the product was AE box for the original versus AF box for the newer one, and so the community took to shortening it to AF. Amazon and Newegg have caught on because some listings on both sites, even official first party listings on Newegg, now list the CPUs as 1600 AF or 1200 AF. So good job, we did it community. The 1200 AF is another that's similar to the 1600 AF refresh where there's some core changes, like one of them being a complete shift in process and architecture while maintaining the three year old naming. So today, that's what we're reviewing. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's RTX 2060 KO. We previously reviewed the RTX 2060 KO model for its fused down RTX 2080 die that uniquely benefited Blender and some professional applications, offering better performance than expected in some pro workloads while offering usual strong RTX 2060 performance for gaming. The RTX 2060 KO also includes the game Deliver Us the Moon for free with EVGA GeForce RTX cards. EVGA is actively restocking its RTX 2060 KO with new dies, which you can find linked in the description below. When we first reviewed the 1600 AF, it was an $85 part, and the conclusion, in short, was that it was a phenomenal price for the component. Unfortunately, everyone else figured that out too, and as it was sold out repeatedly, the price slowly hiked. And now, at least at the time of writing the script, it was $100 at the cheapest on, uh, I think it was Newegg, it was some legitimate retailer, $100 was the cheapest we could find a 1600 AF. Kind of loses a lot of the novelty at that point, and now you're looking at things like a 3100 or a 3300X instead, unfortunately. So it should be 85. The 1200AF is in a similar boat, though. So the recap of the story is that the 1600AF, despite having the Ryzen 5 1600 naming, is actually a 2600 CPU. And that's because AMD, again, the short of it, is that AMD ran out of supply of its original 14 nanometer wafers, burned through it, didn't have any more orders in the contract, and so they shifted the part, which was presumably still desired by someone, probably OEMs who wanted specifically the name 1600 still, shifted the part to 12 nanometer and Zen Plus, which is actually, despite Zen Plus being kind of a refresh of Zen, it's actually a pretty significant change. And one of the biggest changes there is the frequency stability with an overclock for all core. You gained 100 to 200 megahertz on average between Zen and Zen Plus. The other major change is things like efficiency in terms of power for the amount of output you're getting and performance versus power consumption. And there's some architectural key changes as well that we talked about in the Zen Plus announcement video and in the 1600 AF review. So we'll keep this one shorter. The 1200 AF, it's all the same story. Every single thing that was just stated about the 1600 AF, it applies here, except it's a different CPU. So this is a follow-up to the 1200 original. It's maybe more similar to a Ryzen 2300X from the 2000 series. It's a part we never actually got to review. It came out very late in the game and was more of an OEM part. So the 1200 AF is sort of one of those. The 1600 AF's 3.2 base and 3.6 boost was relatively close to the R5 2600's 3.4 base and 3.9 boost stock clocks, especially given that the 1600 AF remains almost constantly boosted to 3.6. So it's close enough to the 2600 in both stock and overclocked performance that we've always been able to say a 1600 AF is a 2600, it's just cheaper. On the other hand, the 1200 AF and the 2300X, which is OEM only as far as we're aware, have a wider gap at 3.1 base and 3.4 boost versus 3.5 base and 4.0 boost. So that becomes significant. The conclusion we can draw here is that the 1200 AF may be heavily limited by its Zen 1 clock speeds that carried over despite moving to Zen Plus architecture. That leaves it considerable overclocking headroom though. There's also a point to consider of the CCX configuration, something we talked about with the 3300 and the 3100 CPUs from AMD. Based on what we know right now, our current understanding is that the CPUs we have at least uh, ends up in a single four core CCX config for the 1200 AF versus a two plus two for the original 1200. Now we're not 100% confident on that because the tools we're using, we don't know. We're looking at Ryzen Master and you can see that you can toggle a two plus two config for the original 1200, but it uses a different version of Ryzen Master and that it's just a single toggle for the 1200 AF. So uh, rumors online did look like other people came to the same conclusion. Either way, if it's true, if it's a four plus zero CCX config, then there's some additional 
room for performance because you're reducing the CCX to CCX latency, which is something we talked about in the 3300X review. And if it works out that it's not the case, then it doesn't matter because we have all the benchmark charts anyway, and those show objective performance. So let's get into that. We'll look at some of the frequency scaling and a bunch of gaming charts with just a couple of production ones thrown in for good measure. Testing a four core, four thread part with a three year old name and a two year old set of infrastructure, ironically, is a breath of fresh air since for once we don't have to worry about GPU bottlenecking. Starting out with Red Dead Redemption 2, using DX12 at 1080p in high settings, the 1200AF hits 57 FPS average. Not incredible in terms of playing the game, but a massive 28% uplift versus the original stock R3 1200. Overclocking the 1200AF pushed that performance up another large step to 69 FPS average with a 0.1% low of 42 FPS. That's potentially playable for a budget PC builder. These results are well ahead of the two-core, four-thread Athlon 3000G, which averaged only 41 FPS, even when overclocked to 4 GHz. And it's also ahead of the Intel two-core, four-thread Pentium G5500. The G5500 is old at this point, but the Comet Lake G6500 isn't yet available for sale, and even when it does show up, it'll still be a two-core, four-thread part. The four-core, four-thread i3-9100F outperforms even the overclocked 1200AF here by 15% at 79FPS average. Its lows are about the same as the overclocked 1200AF, just for reference, and the presumably $100 four-core, eight-thread R3-3100 trounces all of them, with a 100FPS average at 4.4GHz OC, or 97FPS average stock. Since this OC is just for multiplier, there's obviously more room if we did some manual tuning. Again, the 3300X is a better buy than the 3100 in a lot of ways, but the 3100 is a more appropriate price comparison based on the positioning of the 1200AF, and even then, the 1200AF is all over the place in price, and so is the 3100. At stock settings, the 6-core 12-thread 1600AF approximately tied the 3100, but overclocking across the higher thread count allows it to beat the 3100 even at 4.2 GHz versus 4.4 GHz. That CPU should be $85. But alas, the price is destabilized for the 1600AF once reviewers got a hold of it, so sorry. Moving to DX12, with medium settings, the 1200AF maintains almost exactly the same FPS for averages as seen in the 1080p test, as do most of the other CPUs we're comparing here. Since these are all budget parts, GPU bottlenecking at high settings isn't much of a concern as it usually would be for CPU benchmarks and reviews. If the question is how it scales with a price appropriate GPU, we've done a recent GPU bottlenecking test for that. That's a different test than a straight CPU comparison, and its purpose is to show maximum GPU support before being limited. We'll direct you to our R3-3300X bottlenecking piece for more information on thresholds for CPU limitation. Three Kingdoms campaign runs the 1200AF stock CPU at 79 FPS average with lows proportionately behind. The overclock gains it an additional 15% in average FPS, which makes it worth overclocking, actually. Like most Zen Plus CPUs that have lower starting frequencies, this one has plenty of room to grow. The original 1200 with an OC is almost equal to the 1200AF stock performance, while the 1200 and both 3000G results sit closer to the 52 to 64 FPS range for average frame rate. Low scale proportionately across the board here, and without any major dips CPU to CPU at least not outside of the norm. The stock 3100 is about tied with the 1200AF with its own overclock, while overclocking the 3100 boosts it toward 100 FPS. The 1600AF leads both of these easily and solidifies itself as a great CPU at its original $85 price that we paid retail, but good luck getting that today. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is next. The AF upgrade may have made the difference between playable and unplayable performance with this test. The original 1200's average of 62 FPS and accompanying 1% low of 38 FPS boosted up to 92 FPS and 57 FPS respectively on the overclocked 1200AF. The overclocked R3 isn't far behind the 9100 in this test, although the stock 1600AF yet again far outperforms it at 120 FPS average. The 1600AF and 3100 fight for dominance with similar stock and overclocked averages, with the 4.4 GHz overclocked 3100 holding a technical yet irrelevant lead. The 1200AF is definitely better than the 1200, and if priced similarly, it'd be a better buy than the 3000G, if you're not going to use the 3000G's IGP. Scaling between the CPUs is still impressive in Hitman 2, but the average FPS numbers are low enough that it may not seem that way. 68 FPS average for the 1200AF versus 58 FPS average for the R3-1200 non-AF is still a 19% uplift, and overclocking it pushes another 15% beyond that. 
The stock 1600 AF ran 94 FPS average in this test, and the stock 3100 held at 98 FPS average. Hitman 2's results aren't determined entirely by core and thread count, but clearly more than four threads is ideal for this game. As usual, F1 2019 proves that it can achieve high frame rates on even the lowest end hardware, which leaves plenty of room for differentiation between CPUs. The original R3 1200 averaged 110 FPS, and the AF increased that by 26% up to 139 FPS average. We are accustomed to CPU reviews where 10% scaling is a big deal. The 1200 AF is a completely different part, though, than the original 1200, both in hardware and performance. So it's not a typical same generation refresh, despite its naming. Zen Plus was sort of a refresh, architecturally, but it was a significant process change and made some architectural changes. So typically same name refreshes are a frequency change, and that's it. But this is more than that. Overclocking to 4.2 GHz on the R3 1200 AF raised the average again, up to 159 FPS, a lead over the stock AF of 14%. Although it's not quite equal to the 9100F, but it's getting there. Despite all that, the 1600 AF is 33% ahead of the 1200 AF stock versus stock, and well ahead even the 1200 AF's overclocked result. So these newer games, they can make use of more than four threads, and they do benefit from the 1600 AF, or equivalent. The results at 1440p tell the same story. The 1200 AF greatly improves performance versus the original 1200, and overclocking has a greater effect than we've seen in a while. But the results are still sandwiched between the two-core four-thread Pentium and the Athlon at the bottom, and the four-core four-thread 9100F at the top. Without reaching the performance level of the higher thread count parts, it just ends up sort of middling. The Division 2 is a relatively new arrival to our CPU test suite. At 1080p, AMD CPUs tend to level out at a maximum of 185 FPS, while Intel levels out at about 200 FPS. The 1200 AF, fortunately, is in no danger of hitting either wall. It averaged 91 FPS at 1080p medium results, with a potentially troublesome 0.1% low of 48 FPS for a competitive game anyway. That's better than the original R3 1200, which averaged just 76 FPS with 1% and 0.1% lows at 47 and 39. Threads again matter here. The stock 1600 AF operated 74% ahead of the stock 1200 AF. And remember that both are Zen Plus same generation CPUs. Intel's four core four thread i3 9100F is in the same boat as the R3s, only slightly outperforming the overclocked 1200 AF at 109 FPS average versus 104. Moving to 1440p is enough to cause some GPU bottlenecking on even the stock 1600 AF, which dropped down to 142 FPS average and no longer gained any benefit from overclocking. The top of the chart is obviously limited, as the 10900K, 10600K, and 9900K are all the same in average, although the 10900K has a distinct advantage in lows. That's because of the limits here. The other CPUs remain below the threshold for GPU limitation and still show some scaling. So the 1600 AF retains a still gigantic lead of 61% over the 1200 AF stock versus stock. Yes, a price appropriate GPU for the 1200 AF will be the limiting factor in most games, but the gulf in performance between the 1600 AF and 1200 AF in any task that can use more than four threads is incredible, and the number of those tasks is increasing. Assassin's Creed is next. All the 1200 results suffered from frame time spikes in this game, with even the overall FPS average not rising above 74 for the overclocked 1200 AF. The stock R3 3100 held 98 FPS, roughly equivalent to the overclocked 1600 AF, and the overclocked 3100 ran 103 FPS average. That's 39% beyond the overclocked 1200 AF. It's a strong overclocker, but it takes more than that to make up the gap between a Zen 2 part with SMT and the Zen Plus 1200 AF. It does, however, nearly tie Intel's locked 9100F although you shouldn't have bought that to begin with. We'll do a couple of production benchmarks here. We ran the whole suite on it, but it's a cheap part. It's not really meant to do this kind of workload, so we're gonna keep it short. We can at least use Blender as a representative benchmark of pure thread scaling for a real workload. The stock 1200 AF rendered our monkey head file 14% faster than the original 1200, and the overclocked 1200 AF rendered 27% faster than its original. The overclocked results are almost on par with the i3 9100F, but not quite. Obviously, the 1600F has a huge advantage in any tile-based renderer because it has 12 threads and one tile is spawned for each thread. That's as opposed to the 1200AF's four threads. So the stock 1600AF rendered, unsurprisingly, 54% faster than the stock 1200AF. 
don't buy a part with four cores and no SMT for explicitly doing rendering tasks like this one, at least tile-based rendering like this one. Compression and decompression is a much more plausible task for this CPU. It's probably something you'll run into. In compression, the 1200AF executed 21,000 MIPS to the original 17K MIPS, and it doubled its gap with an OC to 4.2 GHz, completing 24.4 thousand MIPS. The overclocked 1200AF effectively tied, or even slightly outperformed the 9100F here for once. Although the 1600AF remains so far ahead that it's hardly a comparison at 41,000 MIPS. The Pentium and Athlon are solidly at the bottom of the chart. Four real cores is better than two with SMT. And the rest of the difference is in things like frequency and architecture. But the threads are a major driver for this one. The stack of 1200 results and the 9100F line up the same way with decompression for 7-zip, but the 1600AF is an untouchable 144% ahead of the 1200AF stock versus stock and 131% ahead OC versus OC. Overclocking helps a lot, but this remains a thread-bound benchmark. Adobe Premiere is next. Our 1080p project file doesn't take excessively long to render, even on these low core count CPUs. The overclocked 1200AF, for example, ranked the best result for the 1200s at 8.5 minutes to render. The 1600AF is as much faster, percentage-wise, here as it ever is, but this test is a reminder that not every workload is as massive of a thread-bound workload as some of the previous ones. Sometimes the budget CPUs can cope. That is, as long as you're not doing this multiple times a day, it's okay for a project every now and then, if it's a simple one. They do struggle to cope with the 4K60 render and the associated project file, though. The original 1200 took about 40 minutes to render this video, and although the overclocked 1200AF takes a chunk out of that time at 28.2 minutes completion, it's nothing compared to the 18.2 minute stock or 16.1 minute overclocked result that the 1600AF can manage. Even amateur video editing and production deserves a CPU with more than four threads, and the 1600AF's OC time at 43% faster than the 1200AF's makes it clear that this would be the best choice at a similar price if it existed. But once again, it's a mythical unicorn that will probably never be had at $85 again, unfortunately. Still though, stretching the budget for something like a 3100 would maybe be worth it if you're doing a lot of Premiere stuff and still on a strict budget. The 1200AF is kind of a fun novelty. It's, it should be cheaper. It's about $80 on Newegg right now. We've seen it on alza.co.uk, which is where we had Buildzoid buy it before it came to the US for us and ship it to us. That, it was about, well, it was a little bit cheaper there when we bought it. it Might have been something like 70 USD after the, the conversion. But either way, $80 makes it kind of a fun novelty part. It's potentially worth it, the 1200AF, for budget builds, especially in the $60 to $65 range for the CPU. And at that point, it's a better buy than the Athlon 3000G. 3000G should be 50. It's been 60 lately. And if the 1200AF is anywhere close to the 3000G in price, if you're looking at a $10 gap, it's a much better part. So if you can't stretch to, say, a 3100, and you're looking at a 3000G as your only real option, the 1200AF is better if you don't need the IGP. But the 3000G has a cheap, pretty low end, but still integrated graphics processor. And if you're not buying a GPU, obviously, that's you're going to have to go with an APU. So 1200AF's best advantage, then, is in a DGPU scenario where you can stretch an extra 10 bucks. But if it's over a $10 price gap, it starts to get really hard to justify because now it's encroaching on 3100 territory. If you ever see a 1600AF, for $85, again, just buy that instead. Don't even question it. Don't look back. Grab it while you can, because it's rare. But anything else, you're, you're kind of looking at a 3100 for the cheapest possible good gaming performer, if it's a gaming build you're doing. If you want a, a less performance-oriented build, 1200AF seems fine. If it's not too overpriced, if it's not 85 plus, then it's OK. But either way, we see massive scaling versus the original 1200. We see much improved overclocking ability. And here it looks better than it does in other Zen Plus parts because the clocks were carried over from Zen 1 despite being improved architecture. So that's an upside as well. And it's something that if you can't afford a 3300X, 3100, or you don't want a 3200G or something like that, and you shouldn't buy the 9100F, then, uh, then it's OK. Uh, that's kind of where we have to leave it. It's not, it's not, it's not as exciting as the 1600AF, but we can see a justification for buying the 1200AF 
It's just the reason I'm being wishy-washy right now is because the pricing is all over the freaking map lately, partly because of supply constraints and availability. So to lay it out really clear, if the 1600 AF is $85, buy it. If the 1200 AF is something like 60 to $70, it's fine. Wouldn't jump and say buy it because it's $15 to the assumed price of the AF or it's $30 to a 3100, which might be a better choice overall. But if you're at like 70 bucks, 1200 AF is worth it for a cheap PC build that doesn't need an IGP. Otherwise, buy a 3000G for a cheap PC build that does need an IGP. We've pretty much killed the 3000G at this point with the 1200 AF if you're doing a DGPU solution. And then 3100, if those prices are not where we just stated they should be, you should buy a 3100 at $100 and not more. 3300X is our preference over the 3100, but now you're jumping $50, and that's a lot. So 3100 is, is reasonable if that's, if that's the stretch. If it's $100 is the point at which you're stretching the budget, that's an okay place to settle and land. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.cameransnexus.net to help us out directly, like by grabbing some of our shirts, mouse mats on backorder or mod mats. And you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus where we just published a new behind the scenes video. And we're working on one actually of popping the heat spreaders off of some memory modules with liquid nitrogen, something that Stepanzi taught us. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.